Good afternoon and welcome back everybody to another edition of the BH Virtual Event Space. We're talking combining cinematic and photographic techniques with Jason Buff. Jason, welcome. Hello. How are you today? Good. How are you doing? I'm I'm doing wonderful. Uh, I didn't tell you in the green room, but if you see me disappear at any point, there was a gas leak in the neighborhood. Oh, good. So, so, so if you just see me gone out of out of thin air, then you know what happened. <laughs> Well, the power comes and goes at my house, so uh, I think I've got enough battery power here. So if it goes, you know, I'm Excellent. just preparing everybody. So we're we're off to a wonderful yeah, well, yeah, that's a great start. <laughs> this, this this will be one of the most interesting events that you come across. So, uh, possibly for everybody for everybody joining us, welcome uh, all of the people on Facebook, Vimeo, uh, Zoom. If you're joining us on Zoom, still welcome. We're happy you're here. Uh, like I said, Jason's gonna be talking about combining both cinematic and photographic techniques, and we spoke about it before. Jason is really into getting those questions in. So if you have questions, don't worry, we're not going to hold them to the end today unless they're completely, you know, off topic. But if it's hint to what we're talking about, we want to get them in, we want to get them answered. So we want interaction from you guys as the audience. So please get those questions in. Or even if you want to just make a comment and let Derek know that I've got a better beard at this point than he does, go for it. We're, we're, we're all game, but, uh, without further ado, I'm going to I get to be in on this whole beard thing. Be, I mean, yeah. You could be in on it too. You know what? Let us know. Jason, it was a goatee, but it's kind of growing back in. I mean, I don't know. There you go. If, if you don't have a question related to photography, let us know how our beards are doing <laughs> and, uh, and we'll, we'll have a, we'll have a vote at the end, but, uh, Jason, I want to thank you for being here again. Uh, I'm going to hand it off to you and, uh, I'll, I'll be around. I'll be in the background. And You'll be around. Okay, great. Be around. I'm not going anywhere. Well, I, you know, I really appreciate you guys letting me have this, um, as a, uh, a way to, you know, just talk. And I, I, um, I hopefully will give some insight into the way that I work. Um, the, the main thing that I want to do today is I think that, you know, every photographer has their own unique perspective that they bring into their work. And um, I certainly don't think that the way that I do things is like the way that everybody should do them. Um, but I just wanted to talk about kind of the way that my background has played a role in the way that I approach photography. And it might be something that's helpful to other people. Um, so what I'm going to do, I think, is just uh, share my screen. So you should see a shot from Blade Runner. I basically just put that to give me a little color on my face. <laughs> so I would be a little more orange. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, what our theme today is. And that is talking about um, basically how to use cinematic techniques in photography. Now, when I say cinematic techniques, a lot of people will assume that what I mean is dramatic photography and photography with, you know, all kinds of like cool lighting and all kinds of like Blade Runner-ish looking things. And that's definitely a part of it. You know, I absolutely love, you know, we'll talk a little bit about Blade Runner. We'll talk a little bit about um, some of these movies that we typically think of when we think about cinematography, people like Roger Deakins and, um, uh, 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 who else? Uh, Vilmos Sigmund and, um, uh, you know, you name it, um, Greg Frazier, those guys. Um, so I'm going to talk for a second about my background and how it's kind of informed the way that I've approached photography, because I did not start out as a photographer. Um, I actually originally wanted to be a filmmaker, and I still kind of consider myself a filmmaker who became a photographer uh, out of um primarily because of my really bad ADHD and my inability to like focus for longer than about two hours on anything. So photography for me is absolutely perfect. Um, so I ended up, um, when I graduated, I, I went to um, UNC Chapel Hill. And after that, I traveled out to California and basically tried to focus on every aspect of filmmaking that I, you know, I wanted to try and do everything. I took a lot of classes on cinematography a lot of classes on lighting. I worked as a, um, a, a grip on just like small television productions and things that were shooting locally. Uh, I would basically do anything that I could to watch a cinematographer, director of photography or a gaffer or whatever, um, work on a, you know, on anything. And back in those days, obviously, we, you know, we're talking like 1996, 1997. So everything was being shot on 35 millimeter film. So you couldn't actually 
sit there and watch, you know, you, you, we had very like uh, primitive kind of monitors that you would watch everything on. It's not like you can actually sit there and watch the actual footage now being shot. So I really got into that and I really wanted to learn cinematography. And so, um, but back in those days, it was very hard to actually get gigs. And so I ended up, you know, assisting and doing anything that I could. And um, time ended up going by and I ended up not really fitting in well with the film industry because it was so um, kind of political or whatever. So I got out of the, the film industry and uh, ended up becoming a freelance photographer, freelance videographer. Um, and to make a long story short, I got kind of away from all that for a very long time. Um, I didn't ever do studio photography until uh, much, much later. But anyway, so when I started to approach studio photography, my background was in filmmaking. So I wanted to kind of, I, I ended up using a lot of the techniques that I had learned on sets uh, with lighting and things like that, working with, um, you know, I had a pack of um, Fresnels, I had like a lot of, you know, I didn't really know how to use strobes or anything. Um, and my background was kind of in, you know, just using lights that I would find at a hardware store or whatever. So anyway, um, fast forward, you know, that gives you a little bit of background about how I started. I eventually ended up working with strobes and I've become more known as a studio photographer in the last, let's say five years. Um, so, the thing that I want to kind of, tr uh, you know, try to discuss is how photography uses storytelling and how storytelling uses cinematic techniques. So um, when we talk about cinematic, the idea of cinematic is not so much that it's dramatic images. It's more that you're telling a story with your images. And so how do you tell a story with an image? We're as, you know, as human beings, we're constantly attracted to storytelling. We try to understand things through stories. Stories are what our primary means of like learning things and empathizing. So um, when you're, you know, I'm, I wanna steer away from saying when you do this or you do that, this is just, you know, strictly the way I work. When I'm putting together a photo shoot, when I'm, you know, approaching an image or whatever, I'm always trying to tell a story. And sometimes I'm successful at that and sometimes I'm not. But so what is the key to telling a successful story? If you are, um, you know, if you think about filmmaking and the way that stories are, or books or whatever, the concept of the story is that you need to have something that is a primary conflict, right? You need to have some sort of um, key, conflict of the story to pull you in, something that pulls you into the story, okay? Um, you need to have a kind of push and pull of black and white or um, good versus evil or, um, you know, dramatic tension, something that makes you want to know more, makes you curious about what you're looking at, that creates a mystery in your mind as to what is happening. Um, so, and then the final, the very final end process, end goal of telling a story is that you have a catharsis with what you're looking at. And I don't mean to be so kind of hoity-toity about it, but I'm trying to kind of get somewhere with this, um, which is that the, for me, the, the best photography is the photography that creates a catharsis in the person that's looking at the image. And this is what happens when we watch movies, when we fantasize as being like the characters in the movies, we fantasize about being superheroes, we fantasize about um, going off at adventures, we, uh, we have a catharsis with people having emotions in movies, whether that's, you know, you might be watching a horror movie and feel, you know, the, I, and I'm not even sure if I'm using the word catharsis right, so don't, don't kill me, <laughs> don't kill me for that, but the idea that I go for, my goal whenever I'm creating an image is that the image is really more of a representation of something that I want someone to feel that connection with. And in my case, you know, to be blunt about it is generally kind of feelings of depression, kind of sad images most of the time. 
I get a lot of um, people tell me a lot of times that my images are kind of a, a downer, you know, and they kind of, you know, they don't have a lot of people smiling or whatever. I can kind of bring up some of, you know, a good example of, you know, if you're not familiar with my work or whatever, you know, my my images are very kind of like somber and not people really smiling. Um, and for whatever reason, well, there you go. That's kind of a smile. But for whatever reason, that's what I connect with. That's what I need to express. That's maybe the, emo you know, if you want to go into a deeper psychological level, maybe that's something that I need to get out of myself. Um, but I don't like to do images that are, you know, happy, smiley images, because I feel like there's a certain, in my world, I feel like there's a certain kind of lack of truth with that. Okay, so, you know, I wanna talk about nine key things that photogra photographers can use to tell stories. And these are the tech, these are the kind of things that, um, that cinematographers and that filmmakers use in order to tell their stories. And the reason why I think it's important is because, you know, a lot of times what we're doing as photographers, like if you go into a studio and you're just setting up a soft box and you're just trying to create like a Rembrandt light and you're, you're just trying to take a pretty picture, um, there's, it's almost kind of like you're taking the same picture, you're telling the same story over and over and over again. And there's, there's nothing wrong with that. And you can make a lot of money as a portrait photographer. I've done that a million times, you know, taking a very nice portrait. But what I think might inspire people is if they start maybe looking at what they're doing in terms of um, what, what is the story of the image that they're telling. For example, in this image, I, don't, I can't tell you what exactly the story is, but there is something going on with the look and the feeling. And what I want is that someone might connect with this image. You know, and it's not about it being a young person or an old person or whatever, that per, there, there's kind of a representation here. And the reason why I like this image is because it makes me have some sort of, you know, it gives me an emotional con uh, connection with it, you know. Um, so I'm going to talk about a few different things that we can do as photographers, and I'm going to try not to bore you guys to death because uh, I don't want to be lectury. And feel free, I don't know how this thing works, but if anybody has questions, please let me know. I'm happy to um, answer anything. Um, but the first thing that I want to talk about is lighting. And of course, lighting is a key element to um, everything that we're doing. Uh, I primarily, you know, work with, um, you know, a softbox, and I, you know, I, I, I almost feel like I could teach portrait lighting in about 20 minutes. And you know, okay, you put, I typically will put the flash um, a little bit in front of the the model or whoever I'm with, or and then I'll feather it a little bit in front of them. Um, but one of the things that I try to do. If you really look at cinematography, and I tell people all the time, watch movies and see where they're putting the light. So, you know, I've got a couple, you know, Blade Runner, you can't get away from it. <laughs> uh, one of my all-time favorites. Um, watch movies like Blade Runner and movies that use uh, a technique called um, chiaroscuro, um, which basically means that you're not just using light. This is a, a great image from... Uh, um, Citizen Kane. Um, if you really want to understand lighting, you also need to understand shadow. And it's very important when I'm working with lighting that, uh, you know, I, I, I kind of like to look at the, um, the light as like, what, what is the light actually coming from? What, what's, you know, when you're lighting for cinematography, a very large part of that is, okay, what is the motivation of the light? A lot of times when we're shooting, we just have a light sitting there and it's like, okay, there's a big, beautiful, soft light over to your you know, side. And I like to look at it like, okay, so obviously we get that from you know, Rembrandt and um, you know, uh, Caravaggio and people that are kind of like the, the masters of light that were, you know, the people that invented this language of light. 
And let me just run over here to Caravaggio, for example. I want to interrupt real quick here, Jason, because we did get a question here. Uh, okay. To some stuff. It, uh, it's from Vimeo saying, interesting, there's no catch light. How important is that to you? Um, okay. So I think that a catch light is very important um, for creating dimension in the eyes. However, there are times when I don't, it's not always necessary, um, especially there. I mean, there are even going to be times when you don't want to catch light because you don't want that. Um, you don't want that connection. Uh, like the, the catch light makes the eyes look beautiful and it makes them look full. And there's the catch light basically is, you know, talking about texture. It's a reflection of the light in the, you know, the, um, the lens of the eye so that you can feel the texture of the eye as something that's reflecting the light. Um, and I think in almost all of my pictures, you know, say for example, right here, I have the catch light. I just, I get in this, this one too, catch light. So for me, the catch light is usually very important. There is a little bit of catch light here. So you can see here just a little bit, but when I'm trying to get, when I'm shooting a really dramatic image like this, one of the best ways to really get that dramatic feel is to try and get the flash as far back as you possibly can and use what's called a short lighting setup. And I have that, let's see, right here. So um, I'm jumping around a little bit, but that's fine. So the thing that's gonna give you a nice dramatic look is short lighting. I 99% of the time will try to short light, which basically means that you're lighting the opposite side of the face and your shadow is gonna be here on the nose. Um, this is what's called broad lighting, I believe. Uh, I'm not great with the names of lighting uh, styles, but I believe it's broad lighting. And this is, you know, I've used this in other images. One of my absolute favorite images in the whole world has broad lighting. This is broad lighting. But the majority of my images, I will try to light from the opposite side. That's eh, not a great symbol. Um, let's see. So this would be an example of short lighting. And so if you really want to have a dramatic looking, you know, shadow on the face and a light on the face, I generally will, if I have, um, let's see. If I have a model who is posing, I will try to get them to look over to the light. Here we go. Okay. So this is me at a shoot. And you can see that this is basically my, uh, this is what I would call a short light setup because the light is going to, I'm, I'm, you can't really tell here, but I'm a little bit further over to her side. And this light here is kind of behind her and crossing over her face. And then this light here is giving me the fill for her face. And I believe this is like a seven foot softbox. And this is a hairdryer <laughs> that's doing absolutely nothing. Uh, we were trying to blow her hair back a little bit, but I don't think it was doing much. But in most of my setups, the light is usually coming across the face. And so I try as much as possible to create that drama by lighting from behind. Um, and you'll see that in a lot of movies. If you really start paying attention to um, most movies, the lighting will primarily come from behind and then it'll be bounced. So this is an example, light hitting from behind and then this is just bounced light back onto her face. And I know they have like an, uh, some sort of effect here. I think there was a light actually on the camera that they used to get this effect. Um, but yeah, so more and more, I try to light kind of from behind, but anyway, um, so yeah, so this, for example, is a, a video I shot. And so I just basically have light shot right from, you know, behind her and it's hitting the side of her face and everything. And it's going right into the camera lens. We're getting that really beautiful, dramatic kind of, um, uh, flare going into the lens. It's not a anamorphic or anything. So we don't have that kind of cool flair, but 
I have a giant white source right behind me that's just bouncing light back onto her face. And so that to me is kind of like the extreme example of getting like truly dramatic light. Um, really just trying to get the light as far back as I possibly can. Um, let me see if I have any books in this. So this, this isn't mine, but uh, this is a great example of basically um, short lighting. So you get this really dramatic look, you get all these shadows on the face. Basically it's like, it's almost as if you turn, you're, you're, you're lighting with Rembrandt lighting. So you've got this like nice little triangle here, but you've got the person kind of turned away from the camera. If we wanna talk about Rembrandt lighting, of course, this is the classic that, you know, I mean, I assume most people would know this, but if you're, you know, the, the reason why Rembrandt lighting is so popular is because it gives you not only a very, you know, sculpted out face with lighting, but you also have um, something that looks very dramatic. And the key, if you ever go into a photo shoot, like I always tell um, people who are kind of new to lighting, the very fastest way to know that you've got the light kind of set in the right way is just to get this little triangle right here on the cheek. And most people will, you know, and that's kind of the, the most basic form of just getting a really nice portrait. Um, but it's famous because it's so, um, it, it, it sculpts the face so well. And so that's really the goal that we're going for whenever we're lighting is to try and sculpt with light and to create dimension with light. Um, and so, okay, let me see. Any more questions out there? I'm jumping around a little bit. Okay, so color is another really important aspect of you know creating cinematic techniques and also um, you know creating emotion with what you're doing. We all are aware of this little guy, which is the um, color wheel. Uh, you know, whenever I start working with something, you know, working with an image or whatever. I don't necessarily go in and really overly design things. A lot of times I'm working with clothing and things that, um, you know, I don't normally work with a stylist or an art director or anything, but you always just want to be kind of aware of how co colors are going to combine. And I think that everybody knows, like, for example, you know, if you've got yellow, then you're going to have kind of a bluish color. You want to have those two, like they'll create a nice contrast for you or, Green and red will create a nice contrast for you and, and whatever. And you can go to, um, I believe it's Adobe Color and you can, you can create kind of color schemes there. I don't wanna to go too far into just like overall color theory, but the, one of the biggest things that I think people don't know when they talk about color is demonstrated by this graphic, which basically is like, when you are working, you know, not all colors have the same kind of luminance values. And so my computer's a little slow. I'll just make it bigger like this. See, I can do it. <laughs> there we go. Can you see this? Yeah, there you go. That's perfect. okay. So basically the idea is that, I mean, this was something that was really kind of interesting to me when I first uh, kind of did a deep dive, you know, mm -hmm. over time I've like, I started out and then I'll go back and say, okay, well, I want to do a deep dive into color theory. And cause I kind of felt like, oh, I kind of get it. You know, like, I mean, look over here, this is like, okay, we know that yellow is going to stick out here and then you've got the purplish, you know, color here. So that's going to, you know, create a nice contrast. But what I didn't really realize was the whole concept of uh, the receding colors, which are these blue colors feel like they're, it gives you more dimension because you are, um, uh, because the yellow literally feels like it's coming out of the image and the blue literally feels like it's going, you know, pushing backwards. So when you look at an image like this and you look at the way, you know, you've got the same exact red tone in all of these, but it feels very different in each one of these, like when you combine it beside another color. So red beside black has got one feeling, red beside white, you know, red beside orange. You can see that these are two colors that are both coming, um, coming towards you. Whereas uh, this 
color combination, the blue feels, the bluish feels like it's going backwards and the red is coming for you, uh, towards you. So you can create dimension using those colors. Um, and so it's just important, I think, to be aware of that. You know, you've got the same kind of thing here where you've got the orange, which feels like it's coming towards you and the blue, which is kind of receding. Um, anyway, okay. So I really highly recommend, you know, there's also colors that give us a very strong emotion. Red, of course, is probably one of the strongest emotions. So um, one of my biggest recommendations is just to buy color gels and um, to play around with those and try to like, you know, it's a very inexpensive way to kind of change your image. Here's another great example of, you know, designing color, reds going with greens. If you wanna watch a great example of color theory, just watch Amelie. Um, and it doesn't have to be absolutely perfect. You know, you can kind of, a lot of times we'll buy clothes or we'll, we'll have dresses or backgrounds or whatever that won't, quite match the color, um, the overall color uh, design that we have. So you have to push and pull it a little bit in, you know, post to make it actually work together. And that's kind of the job of, you know, create, you know, you can create those tones harmonizing together. And then on top of that, you can add some color grading to make the overall image kind of change. Um, so that's what I do a lot of times. If I have like a, uh, reds that don't quite match i'll try to make them match in post and then um then i'll start adding some you know grading on top of it okay so uh i wanted to really talk about certain images that you know are probably the best in terms of like telling a story so the images that stand out in my mind and the images that I always strive for are the ones that, you know, like this probably is one of the most powerful images that stays in my head whenever I'm doing a photo shoot. Um, there's also, you know, other images that I think that people think about like, um, you know, Steve McCurry's famous image here that has a terrible backstory to it, but um, great image. Uh, so that's kind of what I'm going for when I'm shooting people is that kind of thing. Um, now, so real quick, Jason, just to yeah. jump in, uh, we've got another question here from Vimeo. Um, okay. Speaking, <laughs> speaking uh, to do you work with colored lights only in post-production or also in the photo shoot? Are you using like gels? How are you, how are you working with that? Or do you not? Oh no, I definitely work with gels at the studio. Um, one thing that's very important to me is to always have um, CTO gels, CTV gels, and CTS gels. And um, just for anyone who doesn't know what those are, uh, CTO is color temperature orange. You can have half CTO, um, and it's basically this color. So if you get a CTO gel, it's going to basically look like this. And that's designed to show, um, it's very important to understand the Kelvin scale of color temperature in order to not only understand how, you know, white balance is one thing, but also understanding how your eyes work, how we perceive colors, um, how the spectrum of color works. So the simplest way that I can, that I think about it is that you go basically from a thousand Kelvin to 10,000 Kelvin. And, um, most of the time my camera is set at um, 5600k or where you have the little sun on the back of your camera it's usually around 5500 kelvin or whatever um, and that's supposed to be daylight um, it changes from you know different times of day the, the kelvin will will change um, this sort of light is basically what candlelight would be and that would be a lot closer to going down further into 3000, uh, 2000, this might even be closer to a thousand. I mean, so you get oranger and oranger and oranger, the more you, um, the, the lower you go on the Kelvin and the bluer, you get bluer and bluer, um, kind of more like this, 
once you go, um, you know, higher on the Kelvin scale. So one of the things that I really like to do, I, I'm going to skip a little bit forward. And, you know, so one of the ways that I use color is I like to mix those two together. And, um, and it's a very important storytelling technique that I've used many, many times. Um, I'll use this as one of the examples of that. Okay, so in this, to answer your question, this has, I believe, probably just has like a regular incandescent bulb here. And on this side, I would probably have a gel or this would be a, a white light and um, this would be gelled. Uh, so I, I don't really know what I did on this, but um, you can make a you can do a lot of like tricks with your white balance by basically telling your camera to go one way or the other and kind of push it the opposite way. Uh, one of the big like things that I didn't understand when I first started was that I just knew that if, if I put my camera in shade mode, this is a while ago, uh, if I put it in shade mode, it would make my image look yellow. And I was like, oh, that was really cool. And I didn't really understand what it was doing, but, um, and then I would put it in sun mode and it would get more, uh, you know, more regular. And then I would put it in incandescent mode and the whole image would turn blue. And, you know, the reason why it would do that obviously is because it's compensating for the color. You know, if you have an incandescent bulb that's very, very orange and you wanna make it white, you have to add a bunch of blue to it. Um, but if you want to actually make it look like an incandescent bulb that's orange, you just would, you know, you would leave it at 5600 so that it actually looked orange, but your camera is trying to correct it for you. So if you know how to kind of play with that, you can create some cool colors and you can push it into the blue um, without even using gels. So you, anyway, and you can do all that in camera raw too. If you want to go into, you know, your raw colors, you can change that as well. But one of the things that I really love to do, and this combines kind of all those different techniques into one, here's a good example of that. Um, or actually here's a good example. So what we have here is an example of combining these two color tones. So here on her face, you know, there's a flash here, obviously, and then there's another flash here behind her with a CTO gel on. Now, our eye is going to be very happy to um, have this kind of spectrum going from left to right and having this orange combining with this blue. Now, you're perceiving this as white because the camera would have been at 5600K, and you're perceiving this as orange because, you know, Again, the camera's basically sunlight balance. But this also gives a lot of drama. If you were to turn off this backlight, you would not have this, this sort of drama and you wouldn't have this clash. And I'm kind of trying to tie this back to this concept of you wanna have conflicting um, color, contrast, conflicting. Um, another thing is her pose is very conflicted. For example, she's turned one way, her body's turned one way, and she's looking another way. Another conflict that I like to add is uh, wind, adding wind for that drama, um, adding atmospherics. So for example, over here, a lot of this um, light that seems to be like coming into the lens is actually just done in Photoshop. Um, I'll add like, um, you know, taking inspiration from um, something like, you know, this Citizen Kane image. I, you know, I've gone through periods of time when I'm, I'll absolutely overdo the, um, the light shards coming in. I don't know if I have a good, ex I don't want to, you know, show my bad pictures because there's plenty of them, but I used to have a lot of images where I would just every, oh, here we go. This is probably a good example. So this is, this is like the high drama of, you know, what I was trying to create. So these elements here, are all added in post. Um, you know, I have her just kind of like posed up, you know, like she's, the, the idea is always that somebody is walking away from a situation. I call it my Cinderella um, pose. So it's like, I would say you're walking away from 
um, a party, people are maybe laughing and you don't feel like you really fit in that well. And, um, you know, we've got the wind blowing in her face. We've got this look on her face, you know, like, um, you know, there's just a story being told here. You know what I mean? Uh, I didn't do such a great job liquefying, I think, here. So I'll give away some of my, uh, my secrets. Um, I've got all these little elements I've added in. You know, this was all done in post. This light uh, flare kind of thing I added in post. Um, and there's just a lot of drama for me in this image. I really love this image because there's, you feel like there's something happening here. Um, I have two lights. I probably would have, looking back on this, preferred for this light on this side to have been warmer, <clears throat> just to have that contrast. I could have changed that in post probably, um, but for whatever reason, I didn't. Now, when I talk about like, there's something that you, you see a lot with um, portraits and that's basically this, this light, you know, this light that basically is kind of like somebody standing by a window. And we do that a lot. You know, we do that with our soft boxes and we do that with, um, uh, you know, putting diffusion over windows or whatever. Um, so let's take this image, for example. This is an image I really love. Again, I've added in like some atmospherics and things, but I really love this image because we're doing the same thing. It's the same pose. It's the Cinderella. She's walking out. She's going somewhere. She's got her leg up. She's got her arms crossed. She's, you know, put this on because maybe she's cold. She has this beautiful auburn hair. Um, but this light on the light on this side is, uh, you know, daylight balanced. It's there's like a big, you know, softbox here. But when I'm looking at this, the concept for me is, OK, she's looking at something. It looks like she's looking out of a big window. So why is she looking out the window? Is she waiting for somebody? Is she hoping somebody doesn't come? Is she hoping somebody does come? Is she looking at somebody who's walking away? Maybe it's a ex-lover, maybe it's a, you know, a family member, whatever. There's something going on. There's something that she's looking at. Now, remember, we're just in a studio and she's just looking at the wall, you know. Now, on the other hand, on the other side of her is warmth. And what does this mean? Well, this is daylight. And this is man-made light. This is candlelight, or it can be light coming from a fire. It can be light coming from an old lamp or something else. But this basically means interior light to me. And it means that there's something out here, maybe adventure, maybe she secretly wants to leave. And over here on this side is the warmth of home and the feeling of being you know, taken care of or being with your family or whatever. And so when I talk about storytelling, that's the kind of thing that I want to, you know, it might be kind of subconscious, but those are the kinds of things that I think about, you know, that these things do have a meaning, you know, and they might have a meaning for, for everybody. We've all been in situations where we were, we had to kind of like go out of our comfort zone and we had to leave the warmth of of our home and of our you know maybe our friends or the things that we felt comfortable with and go out and do something but that for me is a very important aspect of storytelling and i really did get most of that from you know uh the filmmaking world um i love mistakes like this is a, a shot that has all those elements in it i have i shot her from behind with a a red light in this case and then i think i changed Using um, Photoshop, I think I changed this to a little bit more of a blue. Um, just added a lot of these. I mean, a lot of these are the same elements in the background. Um, and then another thing, let me, uh, are there any questions? Anything? Am I just rambling on? Is this interesting? <laughs> no, no, there, there, there is a question that I wanted to ask you about okay. your storytelling process as it relates to your images. Uh, you know, I think it's really interesting uh, you're talking about the, the the parallels of of how photography essentially relates to cinematography in the sense of storytelling, because obviously when you're thinking of cinema and video, that's that's kind of what it is. It's a series of images that create this story. When you're photographing, though, 
are you photographing individual shoots as standalones or do you photograph in a sense that when people will look at your catalog later on that there's a story it tells for itself? Um, you mean over the course of different images or? Yeah, correct. I think that a lot, it's really interesting because when I first um, really started to um, build my portfolio and started like, you know, going out and shooting um, every single day, you know, um, I was constantly looking at other people's work and trying to copy them. Um, so, you know, take Peter Lindbergh or um, Richard Avedon, Annie Leibovitz, and then combine that with the filmmakers that I really loved, you know, um, Gordon Willis and, and um, you know, whoever. Um, I, I found that in my inability to, I would, I would go out and I would have this idea of like, okay, this is what I want to create. And I think that there are people who, you know, everybody creates in a different way and everybody's creativity works in a different way. So my way of creating is very much about um, discovering things as I'm working. So I don't necessarily pre-visualize what I'm going to do. And I just, I leave myself open to a lot of serendipity and a lot of like, um, you know, trying different things. And if something doesn't work, just changing gears. And I might, you know, based on the personality of the person I'm working with, I might go in a different direction or there might be a, an interesting like thing of light coming through the window. But the thing that's interesting is that, and it might just be in the post-production part of it, my, you know, my images have nothing to do with each other, but they're when I put it all together and I look at it, like say for inst Instagram or something like that, there is a, a consistent style. And I think that just comes from your overall, like the way that you see things. Like if you like a certain, a little bit of green in the, the, you know, in the shadows, or if you like certain colors or if you, you know, and, and it's also evolving. Like I look at things that I did, a year or two ago, and most of it I can't stand because I've moved on to a different thing. Um, so I'm constantly, I, but I think there are certain things that like in my attempt to copy other people in my attempt to like look at something that inspires me and be like, oh, let me try this or try that. And I go to my studio and I fail at my attempt to copy it. But in the process, I accidentally create something that's really cool. And that's one thing that I don't think a lot of photographers will admit to is that a lot of their best images uh, are created by a combination of like skill and, you know, a lot of things, but it's also happy accidents and things just happening in the right way that day. Because I've I can go into the same studio and do the same stuff and have a mediocre photo shoot that I never want to see again. And then I go in the next day and I do some, you know, something else happens and it just looks like it blows your mind. So that's, that's one of the keys for me is to always be shooting and to let happy accidents happen and to, you know, to keep shooting as much as possible so that you, um, you allow yourself to have those uh, moments where just, you know, serendipity happens and things just come together. But I don't know if I answered your question. Awesome. Definitely. Definitely. And I want to, I want to keep in mind that, that we're, you know, we've got a lot to cover and we've got about 15 minutes left, but we do have a lot of questions coming in, which is great. Nobody's commented on the beard though, Jason, nobody's told us who's got the better beard, but we'll, <laughs> we'll skip over that. I don't think they want to embarrass you, but <laughs> well, I mean, right. that's fine. All right. I feel the burn coming. Now uh, we, we got this question. Actually, we got this from, uh, from Sue who says greetings from Costa Rica and Rogelio actually. Sue, um, como estas? Sue, yes. Um, we're good. Um, but uh, do you do you work with your model ideas too? Is it a collaboration? Uh, you know, how do you how do you go about creating those images? Um, I don't know that I understand. But uh, do I collaborate with the models? Is that the question? Yeah. Do you guys do you know? Do you talk? Do you talk your ideas over with the models? Do you get ideas from the I'll, models? I'll tell you I a funny story, and this is like something that happened at. A, I do workshops in the U.S., and this is something that happened in the with one of the models that was there. Um, I will sometimes will will go into story mode, and 
since my original goal was to be a film director and to work with actors, um, I will try to create kind of a scenario where it's like, okay, you're, uh, and I'll kind of go back to the same thing over and over again. So my thing is always like, you're at a party and you don't want to be there and you're five years old and you're like, you know, I want you to get comfortable on this couch and just kind of, and you can, sometimes people that will work, you know, and that will like get somebody in the right frame of mind and you will try different things and you don't want to, you know, I try to go as far as I can, can without posing people too much. I want it to kind of be their natural like way of like sitting or whatever. However, you do need to know how to pose people so that even though we think sometimes that um, people aren't posed when you're looking at them, um, you do need to know certain basics just to make sure that you have diagonal lines, that you are putting their body in a, a way that's um, that looks good. One of my favorite things, if you really look at my images, for the most part, it's turn your body away from the flash and now turn to the flash and about, you know, it's like, I'm giving away my secrets here, but it's like, that's like 90% of my pictures is like, okay, turn away from the flash and now like pretend like the flash just told you something like said, Hey, you know, uh, it's trying to tell you a secret or something. Um, and so that that's worked out really well for me. You want to know the basics also about um, how to, you know, have soft hands, how to maybe point feet, you know, working with, um, you know, kind of learn a little bit about dancing, learn a little bit about um, just, you know, how to, um, to position a body so that someone can sit down and feel very natural, um, but also having like different parts of their body in different positions so that it, um, so that it doesn't look weird, like, so you're not cutting off hands or you're not cutting off arms. Um, and I think another thing is like, you know, maybe talking about the outfits and the overall style and everything. I've been very lucky. Um, I go to like um, flea markets. I go to Goodwill. When I'm in the U.S., the only place that I go is Goodwill. And my, um, you know, that's like my favorite place in the whole world is just to go to flea markets and find old clothes. And here in Merida, I live in, in the Yucatan in Mexico. So we have these things called tianguis and that's where we um, that's where people sell clothes. So I'm constantly going through old clothes and finding little treasures and things. And I buy stuff all the time that I might not use for a year or two, you know, and then all of a sudden someone will come in and they'll, you know, they'll be like, oh, my God, that's amazing. And we come up with a concept or we, we have some like cool red jacket that might work with something. And you just kind of put stuff together. Or I'll even go to like a paint store and um, they have all these old paints here that like nobody claimed they'd mix them, but nobody came for them. And you can buy them for like $3 and I'll just like paint, a, um, you know, one of these um, V flat kind of things and just use that in the background. Um, or you can just use like a gray background and then add texture to it later. You can, if you use um, like um, uh, thunder gray backgrounds, you can, uh, if you go to the gray slider uh, in Photoshop, you can pretty much change the color of the background. And you can also use gels. If you get a white backdrop, you can basically change your backdrop color to anything you want it to be with a gel. So just buy like a, a $10 gel package and um, yeah. Awesome. Now, uh, Harry, Harry uh, said, hey, Jason, uh, your work is very interesting. Would it be fair to say you're a modern painter using the techniques of cinema and photography, i.e. post-processing, to create an image distinct or different to the original scene? Thank you. Well, yeah, the, the thing that's interesting about my approach is that I spent 20 years as a Photoshop guy. So I was a graphic designer for many years. And so when I came back into photography, um, I actually... Uh, I was a very mediocre photographer and I was a really good, not, I won't say retoucher. I was a really good Photoshopper. And I thought I was, you know, so I could take a, a fairly mediocre picture and turn it into something that I thought at the time, like I would never show you those images now, but I, I thought I was really good. Um, and so I, I've been a photographer for let's say 10 years. I've been a Photoshopper for 30 years. So I know Photoshop kind of like the, the palm of my hand. So I, I've been able to 
um, do a lot of, of the effects and things. But that being said, um, it has become very important for me in, let's say, the last five years or so to get it nailed as close as possible so that I can look at, you know, I could pretty much take the, the image straight out of camera and maybe with a little bit of tweaking, um, I really wouldn't need to do that much. So it's very important to me to, you know, I'll say one of the things that really changed my way of working is that if you know about like, okay, if you've ever seen what a raw video file looks like, it's a very gray looking file where it, it, all the dynamic range is squeezed into um, the dynamic range of the camera. And dynamic range is extraordinarily important with photography and with, um, with filmmaking. But what they used to do is they, you know, well, they still do this, but you squeeze everything into that dynamic range. So all the blacks go up to more of a gray and all the whites go down. And then later they add all the contrast back. And I, my way of dealing with that is I want to make sure that my whites, let, let, let's pretend like this is a histogram. Can you see my hands? <laughs> so this is the histogram and here are the whites and here are the blacks. So if you've got stuff that's, that's like way down here in the blacks, you're going to lose all those details. So when I shoot, I'll try to get everything into that dynamic range. Uh, and, and then later in Photoshop, I will have all that information and then I'll put the contrast back into it later. So there is just, I always want to make sure that when I'm shooting, everything is going to be kind of more, I mean, you can fudge that a little bit. There's a lot, I mean, a lot of people like will work in, camera raw and they'll like have everything really super dark and then they'll bring it back out in, in, um, in post. But one of the big things that changed was not just trying to let my shadows, at least having one fill light that was kind of like filling in all those shadows a little bit, if that makes sense. Sometimes I'll just shoot a flash into the wall behind me. Um, I think I have a example of that somewhere. Um, but yeah, uh, like let's say for example, with this, um, one of the reasons why this, this flash is over here is because I was teaching at that point, but a lot of times I would take this flash and put it directly behind me and have it down very, very low at the very lowest spectrum of the, the, you know, the color range. And then just a little pop of light coming from this side. So this light, I would not want to have any shadows or direction or anything. And this light would be completely just be my directional light. And then with this filling, you could move this even further back and you would still get all the detail on her face from this flash, but your directional light would be even further behind. And that's how you get that nice dramatic light, that kind of like um, short light. I love just like, you know, putting the light even further back and then just saying, turn your face a little bit further. You know, you wanna have that line on their face, but turn kind of like that and then the light hitting across their face. Great. Now, Doug joining us on Vimeo wants to ask you, uh, if you hit that point where something isn't working, do you change directions? Do you feel any panic? And if you do, how do you handle it? Yeah, this is great. A great question. Um, a big part of what I like to discuss when I do workshops and things is the psychological component, because a lot of people um, and, you know, I, I went through this a lot, too, especially when I was first starting, which was the frustration of your images not looking like what you're, you know, you have an image in your mind and you get frustrated and you're like, why, why does this guy's image look this way? And I just watched their video or I just took their workshop or I just did this or that and it doesn't look the same. Um, and one of the most important things for me when I show people how I work is I have no fear of taking terrible pictures. I have no fear of my flash being completely wrong. I know that when I first start, it's gonna take me a while to get my lighting in the right place. And sometimes it takes a lot longer than you would think, you know? One of the most important things that I ever witnessed as a, um, I think I was a PA or a grip or something, was I watched a, a cinematographer lose it. 
<laughs> on set because he couldn't get the light right. And he was just getting frustrated and he just kept moving the lights and kept not, and I was like, oh, this is like a thing that happens. Um, so when you start getting frustrated that the lighting isn't working, I constantly move my lights around. I'm constantly changing, you know, tweaking things, putting things down, moving them up. Um, you have to not be so hard on yourself, you know, and you have to be like, okay, I'm going to take a hundred bad pictures before I finally get to something that's actually working. Um, I take maybe in a session, I might take a thousand pictures and I might end up with, if I'm lucky, I'll have five that I like if I'm lucky. Um, sometimes I'll only maybe even have one. Um, and maybe other photographers will, you know, be like, well, doesn't know what he's doing or whatever, but that's the way that I work. And it also takes pressure off of the model because they don't feel like every picture you're taking is going to be like the picture. And they, there's a, a thing that I call the, you're taking a picture of me face that, you know, it's the same thing with when you're directing a movie or, or whatever. Uh, sometimes you just have to kind of like, you know, warm up. You might start out really cold and, and like, you know, I always say that it's, it's like going to the gym or something. Um, we're going to be cold and we're going to start warming up and we're going to start getting more and more in the groove. And then we're going to, all of a sudden, we're just going to get the light right. And we're going to hit a, a couple of like, you know, I'm going to be like, okay, just freeze like there. Okay. Just there. That's perfect. Perfect. And then it'll go back to being like, not so good. And we'll be like, oh, well, we had it. We had it for a moment there, but at least I know I got those shots and then I'll keep moving the flashes around and doing things. I move my flashes around a lot more than the other photographers. Like most of the photographers I've seen, they'll kind of put their flashes and they think that, okay, they're going to stay there. Um, I constantly move my flashes. I have them on wheels. I move them around as I'm shooting. I might even like, you know, grab my softbox and move it over a little bit. You know, um, it's, it's really a workout when I'm doing a, a photo shoot. Um, and I don't really know how other people work, but I, I do know certain people that they'll, they'll put their lights and they'll just sit them there and that's fine. Um, and I'll go into situations a lot of times where I've lit the same thing a million times and it just doesn't work right. And the main thing is just to say, okay, I'm like, I know I'm an okay photographer. I've won some awards. I've been like, I know I'm not a terrible photographer. <laughs> So even though I'm taking terrible pictures right now, I know that I, I know what I'm doing. So, I, I mean, that was like a joke, a stupid joke that I used to say is that I'm a really good photographer who takes a lot of really bad pictures. You know, I just, I just don't show those pictures to anybody. So if you get frustrated, don't worry, it happens to all of us, but just keep the, the whole point is to keep doing it, to, to get into the studio as much as you can, to take as many pictures as you can and, you know, practice as much as possible and you'll just get better but don't don't judge your images so harshly so many people think that the most important thing is the final image but from a mental you know mental health point of view the most important part of being an artist is the process of enjoying the art that you're creating and the effect that it has on your mental health so don't be so don't worry so much if your images aren't just like mind-blowing you know that'll come you'll eventually get pictures that are like everybody loves but you shouldn't be dependent upon like everybody else to tell you like, oh my God, I love, you know, I've got people that love pictures that I hate. And there's pictures that I killed myself for trying to make that nobody, you know, they're like, oh, okay, whatever, you know? So you can't really worry too much about it. That's it. And definitely, definitely. I think uh, don't, don't get uh, caught up in the, uh, the Instagram hype or the, uh, the TikTok, YouTube. Yeah. Whole I mean, I like likes, everybody likes likes, but yeah, yeah every, everybody. <laughs> We all want to be liked. We all want to be liked. Um, I do. I do want to give you an opportunity because we are, we are just about out of time. I do want to give you an opportunity. I know you mentioned that you do do some workshops in the U S um, and, and I know you've got an Instagram, a website. Um, if you want to share that with everybody so they could check you out and find more of your work, because, you know, I think, I think you do have beautiful work. And I'm not, well, thank just, you. I'm, I'm yeah, not I got to about one third of what I wanted to talk about, but you know, I'm for anybody who has ADHD, you understand that it's like, I'm very stream of consciousness and I can't, you know, I'd be very boring if I just went one by one, but the main thing is just to, you know, um, to be inspired by films and to, to try and use that as like, if you get kind of stuck with your, um, with your photography and don't really know what to do, 
remember what kind of, you know, what is the story that you want to tell and try to tell different interesting stories and think about what, what your lighting is telling about like the, you know, I think, yeah, I think you got it. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I'm on Instagram, you know, just Jason Buff is a really easy number. You know, I'm, I'm not uh, related to Paul C. Buff, but uh, just remember Buff. Um, I'm Jabu Studio on Instagram and I do workshops. Um, right now I'm doing a workshop in three workshops, Chicago, Minneapolis and Denver. And um, I'll be doing a lot more in the future. I just that's kind of my favorite thing is um, is teaching and uh working with people. And we talk about everything from technique to, you know, we go deep dive into Photoshop, deep dive into lighting, but we also work as a team. You know, I think it's really important, the, the mental component of working um, with people who are supportive and, uh, you know, understand that this kind of can bring out a lot of negative emotions, anxieties in, in people if they're, uh, you know, creating something and, you um, trying to express themselves. There's always a little bit of, uh, um, you know, you need kind of a safe space for that. Awesome. I love it. Well, Jason, definitely, definitely going to have to have you back so that we can, we can finish off and, you know, get through, get through it all. I, as, as a fellow ADHD -er, I, <laughs> I appreciate it. I think I it kind of like, I mean, I always say, you know, with my photography friends, it kind of goes without saying, you know, I mean, I don't know any photographers who, don't have some sort of ADHD. So, you know, <laughs> it, it works, it works out well for us, but uh, it's kind of, yeah, it's like our superpower. I, I do want to thank you again for being here. And I want to thank everybody for participating. Uh, we got a ton of great questions. And so thank you everybody who participated today. Uh, hopefully we got to your question and answered it uh, appropriately. If not, you know, uh, send all the, send all the, the feedback to, to Jason DM. <laughs> Um, but <laughs> oh, I, I wanted to mention also that if you're interested in learning um, the editing techniques, I also, if you go to portraitmasterclass.com, that's where I have just a bunch of tutorials um, that, that show how I work with, uh, you know, because I ended up um, going backwards and starting out as a Photoshop guy, um, my way of retouching is a little bit different than I think most people. So it's, uh, it's an interesting thing to check out. Awesome. Well, that's all the time we have for you today. We hope you enjoyed this. It's been another rendition of the b &H virtual event space in the books. We'll catch you next time. <laughs> do I get the, the, can I have the laugh track? Can you do that for me? I'll, I'll have to, I'll have to cue it up next time. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we'll right. get it back <laughs> Thanks. Uh, oh, well. We'll, we'll, we'll catch you on the next one.